Take your copy of God's Word and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This week I had an opportunity, as I often do. Many of you know how introverted I am. And so I got to talking to a man, and we we shared the information with one another, who we were and so forth, where are you from, those kind of things. And then the talk, as it often does with me, will turn to religious matters. And I asked him if he had a church home anywhere, and he shared, yes, I do. He attended another Baptist church in another town here in Mississippi. And then I asked him a question that I often ask people. I asked him, I said, well, may I pray for you today? Is there anything I could pray for you about? And his response was the first time I'd ever had someone say this to me. Often in the past when I've asked people, may I pray for you, may I pray with you, they will say, well, no, thank you, or they'll say to me, well, you know, not at this time, I'm okay, everything's all right. But this man looked him in the eyes and he said, no, I handle that by myself. It it struck me and I thought, hold on, now you're a Christian and you handle prayer by yourself. And it reminded me of the California Redwoods. Are you all familiar with the California Redwoods? They are enormous trees. They can grow up to 300 feet tall and over 40 feet around in diameter. That is, that's a big tree. That's larger than a pine tree in Mississippi, let me tell you. I've driven by the California Redwoods. In fact, there's some that are so large you could actually drive your vehicle inside of the tree. That's a big tree. But you know why they're so large? Two reasons. Number one, the California, California redwoods only grow in groves where other redwoods are. And number two, their roots are intertwined with the roots of other redwoods so that as each tree grows, they are helping the others to grow as well. I've had people tell me, well, you know, I don't need to be a part of a body of Christ to be a Christian. No, the answer is no, you do not. But if you want to grow and grow strong as a Christian, the Bible tells us that it is not only important that you're part of the local body of Christ, but it is essential to your walk and to your faith and to the health of your Christian walk with Jesus. And so let me ask you, how tall do you want to grow? How deep? Are your roots in the faith this morning? Would you stand as we honor the reading of God's Word? Now, we're going to look at verses 17 through 34. But for time purposes, because we have already covered some of this just a few moments ago in the taking of the Lord's Supper, I simply want to read verses 17 through 22. But in giving this instruction, this is Paul speaking, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. Now, I want you to understand today, as I read this passage, I am not suggesting to you that factions exist within our church. But they did exist within the confines of the first century church in Corinth. Verse 19. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. May God honor and bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. In the church in Corinth, there were issues of separation. Now, I'm not saying they had separation anxiety, for example, as a child might have if a parent is not with them on a constant basis. It's not that kind of a deal, but they had a separation issue in terms of socioeconomic levels. The rich people ate here, the poor people ate here. In the normal home in that day, there were two main rooms. The first was known as the triclivium. It was the present-day dining room, as we would call it. And what would happen is the richer people who had servants and the like, they would come in to the triclivium sometime at a decent hour for dinner, and they would sit and they would eat. Well, the poor people who were working and could not get off until later could not bring as much food. And so when they came and they were set out in the atrium, 
Very similar to what we see in James, which James says, how could you invite someone into your fellowship who with, you know, and invite him down and has a gold ring and flowing clothes? How can you invite him into a prominent place and leave the poor person in the back with not a seat at all? I, I don't know if he was referring to Southern Baptist, but one of the things I found in Southern Baptist, you don't have to be rich or poor, listen, but you've got to be somebody to sit in the back. But here, you had to be someone to sit up front and in a prominent place. And so the idea of separation was a socioeconomic thing. Now, I want you to look at verse 17. He says, look, when you gather together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. And he goes on, verse 18, and says, in the first place, when you come together as a church, and understand, these meetings were not necessarily worship settings. However, when two or more people gather together, the Bible says, you become one, the Spirit of God is in your presence, and you do constitute and fellowship the church. So these individuals are the church. But the church in Corinth had forgotten the message of the Christ. Unity. Message of the cross, which is unity. And so in verses 20 and 21, Paul says, look, the haves are eating and the have-nots have been left out. I've noticed in life sometimes we unintentionally humiliate other people. I grew up at a large First Baptist church in a downtown city. And there was a large homeless population in this city. In Grenada, you may not notice homeless people as much. But in Nashville, Tennessee, it was not uncommon to see them on the streets. And the homeless people would almost always sit in this section, if we, because we had a center aisle. They would sit in this section and sit all the way back on the back two or three rows. And it's interesting because there would always be a couple of rows empty between them and the church people. And I remember asking parents and others, why are these people sitting back here? Well, that's just where they feel most comfortable sitting. No, the real answer is because that's where the church people felt most comfortable for them sitting. No, it's interesting. Certainly not in the same vein, but similar have I often invited people to come and worship God at Friendship Baptist Church and other churches? And I've had people say, well, you know, I just don't have the clothes needed to come to church. Let me be the first to tell you, you do not have to have a suit and tie to attend Friendship Baptist Church. Most likely, the only time you will ever see one of our deacons is on, in a suit and tie is on a Lord's Supper Sunday. And if you see one in a suit and tie, you pretty well know it's going to be the Lord's Supper today. There are times that your pastor thinks, what in the world am I wearing a suit and tie for? Because some of you would wonder, well, isn't that what the pastor's supposed to do? But I think for too long we have looked at what we wear as a determinant for who we are. And that should not at all reveal who we are in Christ. Some of us may have better quality clothing than others, but I want you to understand this. The quality of clothing is no determinant on the quality of your heart and walk with Jesus Christ. You can have great external clothing and your heart be as rotten and filthy as anything in this world inside. There were issues here. Peter, who perhaps walked with the Lord a little bit closer than you and I ever will until we see glory. Peter thought there should only be certain people who were allowed to be Christians. And he did that. Finally, God got a hold of him in Acts 10. And Peter meets a God-fear named Cornelius. And this is what he says in Acts 10, verses 34 and 35. I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Peter says, you know what? God got a hold of me, and I decided that everyone could be saved. I want you to understand everyone can attend a local church fellowship as long as he or she is physically and mentally able. And I'll tell you something. I've actually seen people wheeled in in hospital beds because of their yearning and desire to be part of the worship of the family of God. Man, what an awesome testimony. 
And some of us say, well, I just don't have time. Oh, but some get it. And they say that fellowship is so sweet, I need that in my life. You see what had happened in the church in Corinth? It's because that the Lord's Supper was not the Lord's Supper. It had become their supper. Now moving on to what Paul says. Look at verse 23. Paul says, this is what I received from the Lord. Basically, Paul is saying, I received some things through oral tradition. For you understand that at the time of this writing, the New Testament is not yet in its full inception. It has not been written. And so Paul doesn't have other books or letters to which he can cross-reference these things. But Paul is saying, this is what the disciples told me. This is what I'm practicing in my life. And this is what I'm encouraging others to do as well. Two main, propon- two main components. Number one, Jesus says, this is my body. Why is that important? Because Jesus gave his life for you and for me. He gave his life. He sacrificed so that we might live. You know, it's not just his sacrifice that Jesus gave, but Jesus encourages you and I to sacrifice for one another as part of the fellowship of the local body. Let me encourage you how we can do that. Deacons, you are to love and encourage families. Sunday school teachers, members of small groups at Friendship Baptist Church, Call people in your class if you don't see them. Check on them. As a staff, it's a joy for me to get to check on you. And I encourage you as a church family to minister to your church staff as well. You may be sitting by someone this morning that you don't know. Before you leave today, get to know them. If you see someone sitting by themselves, ask them next week to sit with you. Get to know individuals. Invest in them. Have fellowship. Because Paul says we should not participate in the Lord's Supper if we're not willing to sacrifice for our brother and sister in Christ. He goes on and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The cup that Jesus drank was obedience to the Father's will. You realize that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. The Bible says that the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed by the shedding of blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, with the perfect sacrifice becoming sin, you and I could not experience the life freedom that he gives through through his salvation and through new life in his name. It would not be possible. And so obedience to Christ for us can be told. It's a testimony to others. Now, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, oftentimes we reference this as lost people, those who have never yet given their lives to Jesus Christ. But I want to share with you, this is what Paul is referring to. He is referring to those who are living lives of un confessed sin. Christians who come into the fellowship with fake IDs. Literally, they take out their card and say, they say, hey, this is who I am. And by the way, for some of you who are wondering, I just got my Mississippi driver's license. Can you believe it? Last week. I'm okay, though. I'm glad to be a full Mississippian, okay? Okay. But you know, there are some people who would pull out Alabama and Louisiana, help us, driver's license. They would come into a fellowship and they would say, well, this is who I am. But it has not their face nor their true identity. The point is, is that guys, that's what we do in God's house today. We bring in fake IDs and we make make out that everything is okay in my life. Yeah, you know what? I stayed out all last night. I, you know, I had affairs with other people who weren't my spouse. You know what? I got drunk, but I'm here this morning, and I'm a good person because God loves me, and he loves me just the way I am. I want you to know something. Yes, God loves you, and he loves me just the way we are. If he didn't, I promise you, he wouldn't love me at all. But you know what? What I do and how I live don't always please God and make him glad. And when I come into fellowship... And I say, Lord, I'm going to partake of this event which celebrates what you did on Calvary. 
When I do that with sin in my life and unforgiveness in my heart and unconfessed sin on my lips, it is as if I take the hammer and the nails and I put cross on the cro- Christ on the cross once again. The Bible says Jesus died once for sin. Once for sin. Paul recognizes this and he says, all right, there are three tests that must be given in order to be worthy to take the Lord's Supper. First, examine yourself. There is only one identity at the table of the Lord, and that's the identity of Christ. Do you look like Him? Are you seeking to become more like Jesus in your life? Second, if a person takes the Lord's Supper with indifference to other brothers or sisters in Christ, in verse 22, they see themselves as here and others as here. The Bible says that is an unworthy heart in which to partake of the Lord's Supper. And third, Look at verse 29. We should share provisions with those who are less fortunate. What was happening is that those people who have or had, they were eating and gorging themselves. And when it came time, the poor people came in. And they had not much to bring and they had nothing to eat, nothing to share. It was a very sparse potluck supper, you might say. And so they left hungry while others left absolutely full to the brim. Paul says, this is sin. In fact, look at verse 30. He says it in this way. For this reason, some of you have even died. You've fallen asleep. Many years ago in 2006, I had the opportunity to go to Ecuador. Ecuador is a third world country. I'd never been to a third world country in that time. I thought I'd seen some poor places in our nation, but man, nothing quite like this. They did not have indoor plumbing. We went to a, and helped a church that was also a Baptist campground, and I'm close to a city called Ambato, and Ambato is a pretty good sized town. I I believe around 250,000 people, so it'd probably be approximately the size of Jackson, maybe a little bit larger. Anyway, during the week, there were just things that absolutely blew my mind. First, I'd never had chicken and, or excuse me, rice and ketchup. But these people ate rice and ketchup all the time. Why? Because number one, it was cheap, but number two, it was filling. And the ketchup gave it flavor. I remember on one occasion, we went to help a church with a VBS. It was a very, very, very poor, poor church. We would call it out in the sticks. I don't even know if they had sticks. But it was about a mile to, the, to our bus. And so I remember walking back to the bus. I took my Bible and some other things, went back there with some other folks, just took some of the things we had brought for the day, and I was going to walk back and help do the same thing. When I got back, Karen, who was our youth minister at the time and helping to lead out on the trip, Karen said, oh, Brother Brian, these individuals have asked you to preach. They're going to have a worship service, and then they want to fix us a meal. Well, I thought, my goodness, I've just taken my Bible back to the you know, back to the bus, but you know, God got me through that. It was a really cool worship experience, but I'll never forget what happened next. They brought us into the upstairs room. I don't want to say it was the upper room, but it reminded me of that. And they had this U-shaped table, and they had, I mean, a feast, potatoes, corn, more potatoes, more potatoes. Well, that was all they could afford. And then they brought out the main course. It was a piece of meat about that size. And I said, oh, I said, that looks so good. What is it? And Karen said, it's guinea pig. I said, oh. <laughs> and then I sat there for a few minutes, and I noticed after about five minutes it was quiet. And all the Ecuadorians were looking at me, and I said, Karen, what's wrong? She said, well, as the pastor, they're waiting for you to eat first. Man, have you ever asked the Lord, Lord, why did you want me to be a pastor? 
But you know, I partook in the guinea pig. And it was so good, I had two. And yes, it tasted like chicken. But I share all that to say this. People who had nothing were giving up a week's worth of food, maybe more, to tell their brothers and sisters from Texas that we are one in the family of God. You see, the Lord's Supper, living for Christ, is not about how I could put myself here and put others here, but it is how we live on the same plane, realizing that we have common property as those in Acts realize, realizing that if anyone is in need, we are to help them in that need. Ministering that if, noticing that if anyone is hurting, that we minister to them, that we encourage, that we strengthen. As the Bible says, that we build others up and not tear others down. We have enough tearing down as it is. It's time we build one another up. On December the 26th of 2004, A terrible tsunami hit Indonesia, killing tens of thousands of people. But I want to share a story with you. Earlier in December, a group of 400 Christians approached the local government in a city named Mauluba. And they asked if they would be able to celebrate Christmas that year. Well, the Muslim-run government said, we don't want you celebrating Christmas. If you want to celebrate Christmas, you must go outside of the city, and there's a hill high above the city. There you can go and celebrate Christmas. And so the Christians got together, and that's exactly what they did on December 25th. They celebrated Christmas. But, you know, they had such a wonderful time of fellowship. They said, we are going to stay one more day on December 26th. And as they stayed on the 26th, the tsunami hit, destroying the entire city, killing almost every single person who was there. The Muslims in the regions claim that the Christian God was upset at the, uh, excuse me, the Muslim God, no, the Christian God was upset at the Muslims because they would not permit the Christians to worship. But others have asked the question, why or oh, why did no Christians die and only Muslims die? I want you to understand, friend, that humanity has been offered the gift of salvation. And a gift of salvation that took place high on the top of a hill in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. We call the hill Mount Calvary. And it was there that Jesus shed his blood and he died so that you and I might have the opportunity to be free from the tsunami known as death and be victorious through the blood of Jesus. Do you have that victory today? Do you have the assurance of eternal life? Because if not, I promise you of this, a tsunami known as death is coming. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that means hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, Jesus didn't die simply to get you out of hell. Jesus died so that you may live now and you may live victoriously through the trials and the struggles and the difficulties and the uncertainties of this age because I promise you, if you live more than five minutes, they will come. I heard this morning a terrible atrocity. We mentioned this, I mentioned this earlier in a prayer. It took place in our culture. Over 20 people were killed. By the way, that number is up to 50 now. I believe it's the largest mass killing in the history of the United States. But you realize this is just the beginning. The Bible says that in the end, Things like this will come. There will be wars and rumors of wars. People will begin begin to become lovers of self and self-centered. Friend, I don't know when Jesus will come and when he will return. I can't ever pinpoint a time, nor would I want to. But I promise you this. He is coming. Have you given your life to him today? If you've never given your life to Jesus, this is the moment to do so. 
I can't promise you that someone won't ever walk in the doors of Friendship Baptist Church and kill every one of us. I would pray it wouldn't happen. We have some measures in place, hopefully, to try and avoid that, but ultimately there's only so much you can do. Where would you stand if you stood before Jesus? Because you see, fake IDs don't work in heaven. You're either Christ's or you're not. You can fool me, you can fool people here. But we cannot fool Jesus. Would you bow your heads this morning? If you've never given your life to Jesus, would you do that? Would you say, Father, I know that I've sinned. I'm asking you today to cleanse me of that sin, to forgive me, to come into my life. I repent, Lord, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you died for my sin. and That God raised you on the third day. I want to live for Jesus. There may be some of you here today who are hurting. Some of you who have friends who are lost. Some of you have celebrations in your life that you need to rejoice in this week. Some may need to rededicate their lives to the cross and live for Jesus. You know what it is God wants you to do today. And it is my prayer you'd be faithful and respond accordingly. Lord God, move and work in our hearts. And may we live for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.